Sabbath. You know what I'm going to say. I gave you two chances, and I haven't seen the church this full in a while. I think we can do a bit better. Let's try again, shall we? Happy Sabbath. I want you to turn to your neighbor, someone that is not in your family. I want you to just turn to them. Give them your best Colgate smile and tell them Jesus loves you. Let's do that. Someone not in your family, okay? Now you sound a bit more alive. If you're happy and you know it, say amen. amen. Ah, there we go. Welcome to everybody. It's so good to be able to be here at church this morning. And you know, of all the places that I've been to, I've not found a place quite like Albury and Wodonga. In what sense? You know, when you're in Melbourne, you grow up in a city, there's, there's not many things to do in the city except go to a park, right? But here, what's a park? You got the Lake Hume out there, you got the river. And you got so many things to do. You got the, the mountains just down the road. And of all the places you could be, I'm so glad you decided to be here and worship with us this morning. So, happy Sabbath, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Well, today we are continuing our study on the sanctuary. And we are looking at how God built the sanctuary. And really what we're looking at also is how Moses built the sanctuary in a sense. And uh, before we get into the study, I just want to ask that you please bow your heads with me once more as we offer a word of prayer. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for this holy Sabbath hours. And thank you, Lord, for your word. I just pray, Lord, that as we now pause in this moment of time, that you would come and commune with us, that the Almighty would condescend as you have before, Lord, to speak to each of our hearts. Guide us, O Lord, is our earnest plea and prayer, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we looked last time at the big picture of the sanctuary, and that was about a month ago. It's been a while since I, I touched on the, first touched on the topic, and we looked at the two great themes of the sanctuary. The first one, is how God is going to deal with the sin problem. And the reason why God has to deal with the sin problem is the theme of number two, and that is God, all he wants to do is to be with us. And sin separated us from God, and that's why God hates sin. It separated us from the very thing that he loved so much, his creation. And we see there really in, in Genesis that he was with us at the beginning and at the very end in Revelation 21 verse 3, the Bible says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them, you see, and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. At the very conclusion of this whole story that we find in the Bible, God is going to finally just be with us again. And that's all he really wants. That's all he even desires, even now. And so today as we look at this first sanctuary that was built there, we want to have a look at what was the key ingredients into the building of the sanctuary. And so we're starting here in Exodus chapter 25, and it's, it's a bit of text there, but do follow along. Exodus 25 and verses 1 to 7. The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering. Of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take my offering. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold, silver, and brass, and blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine linen, and goat's hair, and ram skins dyed red, badger skins, and shittim wood, oil for the light, spices for anointing oil, and sweet incense, onyx stones, and stones be set in the ephod, and in the breastplate. So we see a whole list of materials here, some of which I don't even know. What's an onyx stone, right? Um, some of these things I have no idea, but here God through Moses puts out a call and he says, you know what, I want you to go out 
and I want you to collect an offering so that we can go and build the sanctuary. But there was one ingredient that you see up here that's highlighted and also in bold there. The, 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 the condition was we had to do what? We had to give it willingly. And willingness was a very important part when it came to the building of the sanctuary. And just you get a context of how difficult it would have been for the children of Israel, right? So, so they're asking for all these things, gold, silver, brass, right? Badger skin. Anyone ever seen badger skin before? right? Some of these things is so exotic. And then onyx stones, right? All these valuable and precious materials. He's asking from who? The Israelites, right? Now, where did the Israelites just come out from? Egypt. They were slaves. They didn't have much. But you remember, right? They came out with a whole lot of stuff from who? The Egyptians. They borrowed from the Egyptians. And now Moses is putting out this call I want you to bring all these precious materials so that we can build. These supplies were not endless. They couldn't just go to a gold mine and go, okay, I'm going to go dig for some gold and I'm going to give some of that to God, right? They couldn't just go to a stream and find, find a badger and cut it up and take this kid, here you go. Their resources were in limited supply, and yet, God asks Moses to make a call. Exodus 35, verse 21. Moses is making that call and it says, They came, everyone's heart who stirred him up, and everyone whom his spirit made willing. And they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle and of the congregation, and for all his service and for the holy garments. So there is this call pull out, put out now for the sanctuary. And, and they're coming and everyone whose heart is made willing. And how did the Israelites respond? Well, Exodus 36 and verse 6, the Bible says what? And Moses gave commandment and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp saying, let neither man nor woman make any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. So the people were what? Restrained from bringing. Oh, how I would love to make such an announcement one day. Everybody, this is embarrassing. We have too much. Please stop. Have you ever heard such an announcement in church before? Never. But Moses did. And you're talking about a group of people who have resources in limited supply. Do you understand that? They gave so much until Moses had to make an announcement. Please, don't bring any more. Please. Restrain. I almost... You know, you know what I think of restraining? I almost imagine Moses, and this is just my little childish imagination, but he's holding on to one of the Israelites and he's being dragged along the ground. Please stop, no, no, no more. Amazing. From a group of slaves who had never seen so much wealth in their life in a moment of time, now they're giving so much that they have to have a call to say stop. This is how willing they were. Then we fast forward to the time when the Israelites have now settled in the land of Canaan. King David had a plan to build the first temple. God said no, but he passed on the responsibility to his son, Solomon. And Solomon now, he puts out a call. And he makes this interesting message out to everybody, which is very similar to what we see in Exodus. First Chronicles 29 and verse 9, the Bible says, Then the people rejoiced for that they offered what? willingly because with perfect heart they offered willingly to the Lord and David the king also rejoiced with great joy look now we're on the other end first we saw the children of Israel but Solomon he's renowned for what he's okay he's famous for a few things but in context of this what is he famous for he is very rich right Solomon is probably the richest kings of all the kings of Israel and Judah and even the combined kingdom together. And yet, he did not stop to make a call out to the Israelites to give them an opportunity and a privilege to be part of the building of the first permanent structure of the sanctuary. Solomon could have done it himself. He didn't have to make a call out, right? 
But yet they would come and they were rejoicing. They were offering willingly. It was a privilege and a high calling. So friends, when it comes to the building up of God's church, to getting involved in sacrificing. Maybe you might think, oh, I don't have the strength, I don't have the energy, I don't have the time. But there is also a, a place for the support of the gospel work as well, amen? Wouldn't it be great where instead of downloading phone books, uh, I'm not dumbing that down, okay? I'm not saying it's bad. But someone comes and says, you know what, don't, don't deliver phone books. Here's the money for the pathfinders. Amen? Amen? You're like, oh, no. But then the kitchen, you know, th this church is pretty old. You can tell by the color of the walls. <laughs> it's all brown. Things need to be upgraded all the time, right? The kitchen itself is all moldy. We've had the extension. I think, I think we've got to work on the hall. There's so many things to, to, to do if we would just put out a call and people would just say, I would love next week to say, you know what? We got too much, folks. But the children of Israel counted it a privilege. They could have said, Solomon, you got enough money. Why are you, why are you putting a call out? Right? You could fund this yourself. And he could. David had gathered a lot of the resources already before he died to make the work easy for Solomon. But he says, no, I've got to give the people a privilege to get involved in the work of God. And they rejoiced. They were so happy. And then we come to the third sanctuary. This is after the children of Israel have been conquered by the Babylonians and they are now let free and they come out and they've gone back to Israel and now another call is made to build the sanctuary, the one that Jesus himself would grace. Ezra chapter one and verse six. And all they were about them strengthened their hands with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, and with beasts, and with precious things beside all that was willingly offered. All three times in regards to the sanctuary, we see this one characteristic come out, and that is a willing heart. Oh, how God desires that we would have willingness. You see, friends, we must have a willing heart before God can dwell in us. We must have a willing heart if we are to ask God to cleanse us from sin, the two great themes of the sanctuary. You see, in the early church, when the church began to explode and, and the believers multiplied rapidly, hundreds were being baptized every day, God was touching the hearts of the believers to sacrifice for the church and for the gospel work. And this is what we read in Acts chapter 4 and verses 32 to 37. You can go there, turn your Bibles there if you'd like to and follow along. It's a long passage, but this is what was taking place in the early church. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. They, they believed that yours is, my mind belongs to God and it belongs to everybody. It's for everybody to use. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. And neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who by the apostles was in surname Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite and of the country of Cyprus, having land, he did what? He sold it as well and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. This is what was taking place in the early church. As the church began to spread and to multiply, they saw that there were many people that were in great need. And friends, you know what? If our church is going to grow, it's only going to require greater sacrifice. If the church is going to grow beyond the four walls here, I'm telling you there's going to be a, a greater sacrifice and a greater outlay of means. 
Are you ready for that? And then there was a couple in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 to 2, who decided to go down that path as well. But a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold the possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. What happened? Ananias and Sapphira, they got caught up with the revival and, and, the, uh, and the, the work that was taking place. And they, they clearly saw the Lord working. And, and so they went out and they sold their land. And they sold it, let's say, for 100000 But they said, you know what? That's a lot of money. I've not, not seen this much money in a long time. Let's keep 20000 of it. And they came and told Peter, here's the money. Here's the 80000 that we got for the land. And you know, they got a bit caught up with covetousness. They were willing, but only partially. And you know, friends, it seems like when they saw that money, something, something stirred up in their heart before they were able to take action. And, and you know, this is really important because sometimes we see with the young people, uh, and I've seen this, and I've been involved in a lot of youth conferences over the past two decades. And the young people, they'll, they'll come to church, or they'll, pardon me, they'll come to the conference and they will hear some amazing preachers and it'll touch their hearts and then they'll go home and the family will think that they've made what, what you call an emotional decision. Why? Oh, mom, I don't want to go to uni anymore. I want to be a missionary. Oh, what happened? You know? And the young people, they're on fire and they want to give their life to God. They want to get involved in ministry. Mom, I don't want to be in IT anymore. I want to be a pastor. Oh, no. What happened? You know? And they think that, ah, oh, this youth conference is not good for them. But what happens is sometimes the longer we dwell on something, the harder it is to make a decision, isn't it? If only Ananias and Sapphira had not dwelt on this so much and they sold the land and they quickly went and gave that money to the apostles. It's like, you know, you get paid a salary. The longer you wait to pay the tithe and offering, the harder it gets. Because you see your bank account shrinking and shrinking and it's like, oh, you know, maybe I could use this for something else. So I, I'll do an IOU, God, right? But their willingness waned, why? Because of their covetousness. How important willingness is. Willingness to bring the materials in the building of the sanctuary. Willingness to let go of our sins. You see in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7. The Bible says, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart. So let him give, not grudgingly, or of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. You know, Paul points to the fact that God doesn't only look at what we do, but our motives and our attitudes and how we do it. Ellen White goes so far to say, it's not about the evangelizing that I want you to do. It's not doing the work itself, but it's the spirit in how we do the work. Do you see that? And so God does care about our hearts. He does care about how we view this. Instead of just going, hmm, here's 10% God. God, he wants us to change that over time. He cares not just about the gift itself, but about the giver as well. And you know, coming back to the sanctuary, why would a person go into the sanctuary or go to the sanctuary in the first place? What's the reason why any Israelite would go to the sanctuary? Because they had sinned, right? And yes, there were other reasons um, to give thank offerings and peace offerings, you know, a heart of thankfulness. But the most common one that we're familiar with is the sin offering. So they would come and they'll bring a lamb, right? Yes? And they would walk over to the sanctuary and look, the sanctuary was right in the middle of the whole camp. And it, it seems like, this is not drawn to scale, okay? There was a much larger, larger distance between the, the first borders of the tent 
up to the sanctuary. It was a bit of a distance. But if you are not willing, I'll tell you, it'll be difficult. You know why? You're carrying the lamb, and then here, here, here's the neighbor. Hmm, I wonder what she did. <laughs> Isn't that the boy that your friend's dating? Right? You're bringing this lamb. And can you imagine as parents, okay, you sin. Son, go confess your sin. What if he wasn't willing? Would he go? He gets to, the, he gets to the, the, the sanctuary and he brings the lamb, right? Okay, son, go confess your sin over the head of the lamb. What'd you do? Why are you here? And he says what? My, my mom forced me. What would the priest say? Go home. <laughs> if, if you're not willing to confess, you don't want to, it's okay. You go home first. Do you see that? How important is willingness. We must come to that point where we have that willingness to sacrifice, willingness to say sorry, willingness to do the work of God. But there is one thing that precedes all of this. Where does willingness come from? It's called self-realization. You see, friends, this is the biggest challenge with our generation today. In Revelation chapter three and verse 16, a very famous and familiar text to the Laodicean church, the Bible says, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and what? And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. The Laodicean church, the, the, the biggest challenge is we don't know. We're not aware. We don't understand our true condition. Because if we did, it would be easy. The motivation and the willingness would be there. Does that make sense? You see, I want you to think of some of the things that you've done in your lifetime. Maybe the extremes that you have gone before. I struggle with uh, pimples growing up. Anybody here struggle with that? Acne? I would see my brother and sister go off to do facials and they come back with glowing skin. I would go do the facial and my pimples got bigger. How far do you go to do certain things just so that you can remedy that problem? Well, number one, do you realize it's a problem? If you do, I, I, I knew about this one person who he, he had bad acne growing up and he was in the world, he wasn't going to church, he was clubbing and doing all these things, but when he found out that um, his diet could help him, he started going clubbing with carrot sticks and celery sticks. He wouldn't eat the chips, the fries, all the oily food. He literally, he told us, this was his testimony, so I don't know if it's true or not, but he said, I would go into the nightclub and I'd pull out my carrots and my cucumber and my celery. And lo and behold, his face got better. But you see, he was willing and he didn't care what people thought because he realized, I need help with my face. Do you see that? I knew another person who grew up very, very skinny. And he was so skinny, his shoulder would get dislocated from time to time. And just the muscle wasn't there. So he went above and beyond and he bulked up so much that he walks like this now. He, he, does, he can't put his arms together. <laughs> he literally has his arms flailing out a little bit because of all the muscle that he has. And he's gotten to the point where I said, hey, his name is Tim. And I said, uh, you're looking a bit obese, man. He's like, no, 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 no. I have a plan. He said ever, ever since he bulked up, his shoulder has not dislocated. You see, how far do we go to certain extremes? I wouldn't say, maybe to some that might be extreme, but I would never want to be so big. And he, he was huge. He was taking protein drinks. He was doing all sorts of stuff just to bulk up, just so that he wouldn't have this pain in his shoulder anymore. 
And sometimes we are willing to do certain things because we realize our situation. You see, willingness is built on self-realization. If we had a proper understanding of self, the willingness to do certain things, no questions asked, isn't it? And so that's why we see this foundation of self-realization. But coming back to the sanctuary, the need to realize that we need help, that we're sinners, that we're hopelessly lost without Christ is always the first step in even coming to the sanctuary. So as God made the call out to the children of Israel, if you're willing, please bring an offering, and they were. Also, the steps that lead into the sanctuary and going through all those furnitures that we're going to look at, the first thing is always, are we willing? But before that, do you realize you need help? If we go to Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 19, why is a willing heart so important? The Bible says this, if ye be willing and what? Obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. What, what goes together with willingness? It is obedience. God requires obedience from the heart, not forced obedience. You know, and, I, and, I, and I've said this to my children before. I've been guilty of this. I'll say to my son, Caleb, Caleb, say sorry to your sister. Sorry. That's, that's forced obedience, right? That's not from a willing heart. But obedience without willingness is not love. It's coercion. And that's not how God works. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 2, it says, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. It cannot be by constraint. We have to be willing. There's that freedom of choice that God gives to all of us. And he doesn't want us to be forced into do, doing the things that are good. It has to be from the heart. You cannot be forced to go into the sanctuary to make an offering. You can't be forced to make a confession. Well, I'm, I mean, I guess you can, but is it really a true confession then, right? So it has to come from a willing heart. Compulsion is something of an external pressure, whether that's your parents hovering over you, whether that's a gun being held at your head, whatever it is, an external pressure is usually coercion, but willingness is something from inside. It's right here in our hearts. Sin, it's a heart issue. It's not external circumstances, but it's from within. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So God, he has to start there. Not to say that it can't come from an external situation first, but if we are to have final confession, final repentance, it has to come from within. So external situations can take place. For example, let's say you hear a sermon and it convicts your heart and you go home and say, you know what, God, forgive me. I mean, that's, that's exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost. Peter preached, right? He stood up in Acts chapter 2, and he preached this amazing sermon, and then look at the result in Acts chapter 2 and verse 34. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter, to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? So Peter goes and then tells him, go and repent. So there can be some external situations taking place to cause you to be convicted, the light bulb to turn on in your heart and mind. But eventually, ultimately, it's a heart issue. You see that? It could be an act from somebody else. Romans chapter 12 and verse 20. Therefore, oh, pardon me, I skipped a, I skipped a text. 
Romans chapter 12 and verse 20, it says, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. That's exactly what happened with King David and Saul. While Saul was hunting David, David found him in a cave one day and cut off his skirt, right, his robe. And then he held it up and said, hey, King Saul, I could have killed you, but I didn't. I have no, no fault or harm or business against you. Why do you keep hunting me? And for a while, Saul's heart was changed. He was convicted that not only had he done wrong, but truly David was the better man and that he would be king one day. But it didn't change him enough, did it? And so as a result, Saul, he did walk away from this. Twice it happened. The second time he, he crept into the camp whilst, while Saul was asleep and stole his spear and his water bottle. And he said, I could have killed you, but I didn't. I have no fault or business against you. But what was the problem? He did not go through the steps in the sanctuary that we'll be looking at in future studies. Sometimes, friends, it's even a stern word from God's messengers. King David sinned against, against Uriah, took Bathsheba, and uh, what happened? God would send Nathan the prophet to give a parable and then point out, you are that man. But the conviction there rested heavily upon David. He had to have a stern word from a prophet to stir up his conscience. But in the end, he would pen these words in Psalms 51 and verse 10, create in me a clean heart. You see, friends, sin is a heart issue. When it comes to all that takes place externally with what we do, whether that's killing somebody, whether it's stealing, whether it's lying and cheating, those are external things, but they stem from the heart. And God is interested in the heart. Too often, as adults, as leaders in the church, we focus on the external. We do. And, and those things are important because it helps us to understand where a person stands with God, right? But too often, this is how we deal with external issues. One day, you, you, you grow a, a, a plant and you think I'm growing an apple tree. 10 years later, behold, I, I don't know how long it takes, but you know, 10 years later, behold, out grows an orange tree. Wait a minute, I wanted an apple tree, right? So what do we do as good Seventh-day Adventists sometimes? We go up to the, apple, the orange tree, we pluck off all the fruit and said, bad person, next year, grow apples. What's gonna happen? Oranges are going to come out. We're not dealing with the root of the problem. We're not dealing with the heart issue. We just tell people, hey, don't do this. Don't say that. Don't do this. Don't be that. But really, it's in here that we got to deal with the issues. And nothing can pierce the heart like the Word of God. Amen? Our words... It just hardens the heart. But God's words, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. God wants to write the law in our hearts and in our minds. It's one thing to know the 10 commandments. It's another thing to love them. When we become a people of the word and we don't love it and we don't fall in love with Jesus of which the word points to, the word of God just becomes a condemning thing because we know but we don't want to do. You see that? The word of God then becomes a burden for us to carry around with us everywhere and we end up despising God's word without realizing that if we would just ask God to put his word in our heart, it would change our whole posture towards how we see religious things. If we allow Christ to write the law in our hearts, the result is what we find in Psalms chapter 40 and verse 8. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Delight, yes. Delight in coming to church. Delight in the Sabbath. 
Delight in spiritual things. Delight in opening the word of God. Delight in all the things that we get involved in as a church family. This is important. It's an emotion. It's not just, hey, love is a principle, we're told. But God desires us to have good and happy emotions as well. That's where the delight comes in. And if we're willing to take those steps, God is the one that is willing to take the responsibility. What do I mean by this? Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13. It says, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. The doing is the obedience. The willing, it's from God as well. It's not from us. Hey, if it was left up to us to make a decision, none of us would be willing. Let's just be open and honest and frank about that, right? Yeah? Yeah, there's a few of us who are willing to admit that. But if we left it up to ourselves, none of us would rock up to church. Oh, but Ben, what are you talking about? I want to go at church. I'm telling you, the only reason why you desire to be here is because God helps us to be willing. Amen? We have no good desire or good impulse of our own, friends. None. Not a single one. It is God who wills. And it is God who does. I want to show you a quote taken from Christ's object lessons. It's a prayer that I have memorized over the years. It's a prayer that I pray constantly each day as I kneel before God. Let's read it together, shall we? One, two, three. Lord, take my heart, for I cannot give it. It is thy property. Keep it pure, for I cannot keep it for thee. Save me in spite of myself, my weak, unchristlike self. Mold me, fashion me, raise me into a pure and holy atmosphere where the rich current of thy love can flow through my soul. This is a beautiful prayer that I, I, want, you to, I want you to write down and, and make it a point to pray this every day. Look at how the words go. Lord, take my heart, for I cannot give it. If it was left up to us, we would never surrender our heart to Jesus. Never. What's our part then? We can only consent to let him do it. And so I always pray, God, please, quickly take my heart before I change my mind. <laughs> If you're sitting here and you have a heart that's willing to pray this right now, you might not be willing to pray it tomorrow. So what you got to do is say, God, right now where I am, just take my heart. Right now, help me to surrender before I change my mind. Before we go back to the, the normal everyday life that we have and we forget about learning to surrender to God, just right now, please come and take it before I change my mind. And you know, this is not for the prayer of those who are struggling at the beginning of their Christian journey. Look at what is said in the very next paragraph. It says this, it is not only at the beginning of Christian life that this renunciation of self is to be made. It's not only at the beginning. At every advanced step heavenward, it is to be renewed. Do you see that? All our good works are dependent on a power outside of ourselves. Therefore, there needs to be a continual reaching out of the heart after God, a continual, earnest, heartbreaking confession of sin and humbling of the soul before Him only by constant renunciation of self and dependence on Christ can we walk safely. Friends, it doesn't matter how many positions we have held in the church. It doesn't matter how long we've walked with Christ. It doesn't matter how many times we have read through Scripture from the Bible from cover to cover. Every advanced step, we need to pray this prayer. God, take my heart, for I cannot give it. Moses, 120 years he had been with God. Well, 
40 years in Egypt, he's probably a pretty bad person, but you know, he still remembered his mission. But 40 years in the wilderness, 40 years leading the children of Israel, every day he had to wake up and said, God, take my heart, please help me. Save me in spite of myself. Save me from myself, he's praying. Every day we got to pray this prayer, friends. You know, I want you to consider Christ as he was praying in the garden of Gethsemane. The crisis that he was going through was so intense. The pressures that were mounting upon his life was so great that we're told in Luke 22, 44, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling to the ground. The trials that Christ went through were so intense before he ever even came to the cross that the pores broke out and blood came out instead of sweat. This was such the agony that Christ had to go through. And what was this battle all about? Whether he was going to die on the cross for you and me. In Matthew 26, this is his prayer that we've read so many times over. In verse 39, and he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed saying, Oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. If we were to translate this into our modern language today, what is Christ saying? Father, I don't want to die for them. I'm not willing. But then it has that amazing word there, nevertheless. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. In the garden of Gethsemane, it was a battle over the human flesh, that old man that all of us have in each of us, and the desire to do right. His humanity cried out saying, it's not worth it to die for these ungrateful human beings. The sting of death seemed too great. And for a moment, he was not willing to go through with that great plan of salvation. But as he prayed, he was able to gather strength. As he prayed, he allowed God's will to prevail over his own human desires. And so friends, before we ever come to the entrance of the sanctuary, it's a battle of our desires, our wills, right? God's will versus our will. And yet the Bible tells us that there will be a group of overcomers at the end of time. It gives us this picture and glimmer of hope that there will be a group of people that will be able to put God's will first above their own desires. We read about them in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 6, not with eye service as men pleases, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. You know, friends, the servants of God, they do the will of God from the heart, it's their desires. Why? Because every morning, they've committed their life to God. Before they get busy throughout the day, they say, God, take my heart today. Before I run amok, before I go do something that I'm gonna regret for the rest of my life, take my heart right now. I can't give it. You gotta come in and take it. But I'm just giving you this small little time while the door is cracked open Please, God, take it. And in Revelation chapter 7, verse 3, talking about those who have the seal of God, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God. Where? Right here. Finally, fully surrendered to Christ. Finally fully God's. Finally, no trace of that old man of sin left anymore. But friends, until we get to that day, we have a work to do. We got to pray. Pray not for confession of sin, 
Pray that we'll be willing to confess our sin. Not pray for the sin itself, but pray that we might recognize when it is sin. There's all these things that must take place even before we ever come to the entrance of the sanctuary. Before we are willing to walk through those gates. Before we even are willing to pick up the lamb and say, God, okay, I'm going to the sanctuary today to confess my sin. There's all this battle that's taking place in our hearts, friends. And it's done on our knees. We've got to pray, God, take my heart. I can't give it. Do we have willing hearts? None of us do. Only as we've allowed God to work in and through us. And so in this coming week, friends, I want you to take that prayer down. I want you to read it word for word. At every advanced step, if we are to make any progress in the Christian life, we need to pray that prayer. Are you willing? I hope that we are. That as we have this time to pause from the rush of our life, I hope that God has spoken to your heart today and say, my son, my daughter, I want you to come up higher. And what does that mean in this coming week? It's not anything I want you to do physically, except be willing to utter this simple prayer. Take my heart, Lord. I cannot give it. Save me in spite of myself, my weak and Christ-like self. We need all the help that we can get. And the only one that can help us, friends, we know it's Jesus. But we've got to be willing to pray. That's where it starts as we surrender each day to God. Then the steps in the sanctuary become so much easier, isn't it? Then it's easy to follow Jesus. Then it becomes easy to do whatever he wants us to do. Not I, but Christ. May he be the one that dwells in each of us today. Begins with a willing heart. Let's stand as we sing our closing song. Sweet hour of prayer. As the singers come and lead us, how important prayer is. Such a simple, 